Welcome to the third part in our series on CICD. I'm Suri and I work on the content team here at GitLab. We're thrilled you're joining us to learn how to remove barriers between developers and operations. If you have questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll also dedicate some time to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. If you have any technical difficulties, please use the chat function and I'll do my best to help you. On this next slide, you'll see our agenda. Today, Lassi Videmski, an implementation engineer, will help us unite development and operations teams. So let's get started. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you, Suri, for the introduction. Uh, hope you're having a great day in whichever time zone you're in. Uh, my name is Lotsi. Uh, I've uh, added a, a, a pronunciation there for your uh, reading needs. And I'm an implementation engineer with GitLab. And what that means is I help our customers um, run GitLab in their environments. Uh, I also do uh, trainings around uh, Git workflows, uh, GitLab workflows, as well as continuous integration and continuous delivery deployment. Uh, and also provide migration assistance uh, coming from legacy source control systems. Today I'll be talking about some of the foundations uh, around uh, CI, CD, um, defining those terms, and um, talking about some of the barriers to adopting uh, uh, these workflows or practices. And then uh, talk about some of the solutions that uh, GitLab offers. So if we go to the next slide, um, CICD is kind of a, a funny territory. Um, there are many definitions, uh, academic papers, talks, and uh, they blur the lines in terms of where one begins and one ends. Um, but they do have a few common attributes, and I'm going to try to address some of these. Um, and, and just so you know, coming from, uh, and I will be speaking from uh, experience. Uh, prior to GitLab, uh, I was a software engineer, uh, a Rails developer, um, did a bit, uh, quite a bit of front end work as well, um, as well as DevOps. So I've uh, touched a lot of uh, different parts of the software delivery uh, cycle. Uh, I, I came from the startup world, so uh, most of my experience has been with smaller to medium-sized teams. So I'm gonna very much speak from that uh, uh, experience. Um, but in, when we define these terms or define these practices or disciplines, some people call them, um, one common uh, attribute is this concept of smaller. How do we make the work we do uh, in smaller pieces so that we can reduce risk. And if I were to kind of rename all of this CI, CD, uh, I would call it continuous risk reduction. Um, and there's a reason why that hasn't stuck, <laughs> but th th that's another way to think of it. Um, how can we make things smaller so we can reduce risk on a, a number of different levels? And then I would say another common attribute is automation. Uh, what can we automate? Um, there, there are plenty of uh, uh, human intervention, in, interventions, but apart from those, uh, can, we, you know, can we automate many of these pieces? And, and why do we do this? Why do we do smaller? Why are we reducing risk and why are we automating? Um, and it has to do really with, uh, we, we, we're done doing deployments on evenings and weekends. Uh, I've been there, uh, many companies are still there, uh, and uh, there's no reason for it. Um, we can change our workflow so that folks can close their workstation and go home and get a night of sleep and come back refreshed and uh, be making meaningful changes the next day, the next day, and the next day. So no more weekends and evenings. Um, and then another reason we're doing this is uh, it's great to run experiments in production. Uh, and I know that sounds crazy and risky in, its, in and of itself, but um, some of the most meaningful lessons that we get in uh, building software and deploying it into the wild is feedback. 
So how can we capture feedback uh, in our production environment? Can we also capture feedback in maybe a staging environment? But how do we close that feedback loop with our customers and uh, continue to mitigate risk even at the feature level? So if we go to the next slide, we're gonna begin uh, defining some terms. What is continuous integration? So let's start there. Uh, and if we move to the next slide again, um, here is the, uh, the entire software delivery life cycle in one graphic. Uh, on one end, on the left side, we have uh, the ideation phase. Uh, this is where we begin to size features and, um, or user stories and start to uh, uh, attach uh, various milestones or issues to those. Uh, all the way to the right where we're doing monitoring uh, deployments and also gathering feedback. So uh, can CI really fits in the middle. And if we again go to the next slide, um, it encompasses, yes, uh, automated testing, but also uh, the uh, code and commit workflow. And why is that the case? Next slide. Because, and as MPJ of Fun Function fame, one of my favorite YouTubers out there, um, characterizes uh, this commit workflow as seeking to avoid the monster merge. Monster merge is, uh, you know, in the old days, uh, you were uh, handed an assignment or you accepted an assignment. You would uh, retreat to your coding cave and start developing, start building, and you would emerge, you know, days, weeks, maybe even a month later with your pristine solution, beautiful, all packaged up. You would deploy it into production and all of a sudden everything's broken. You've, you've broken the, the, the deploy, you've broken maybe some of the work on your uh, colleagues' local machines when, as they've incorporated your changes and you're at an impasse. Uh, you, there's merge conflicts to resolve, uh, th and, and why does this happen? Uh, this happens because uh, as you're beginning to gather these changes uh, over time, code has changed beneath your feet. Uh, and so how do we avoid this monster merge? Well, one way, and this is what uh, CI purports to uh, tackle, is we make our merges smaller. And why do we make them smaller? If we go to the next slide, the goal is really to have smaller haystacks. So when a problem does occur, which inevitably they do, even when we make them smaller, uh, the uh, proverbial needle, it can be found quicker in a smaller haystack. Uh, so CI, uh, the goal of CI is to create more frequent, uh, uh, hopefully daily commits, um, and in smaller chunks. Uh, and with that, we have our testing suite uh, that's automated uh, to ensure that work that is merged is sound for others to iterate upon. So smaller haystacks, smaller units of change allow for problems to be found faster. So if we continue to continuous delivery, uh, and so the next slide, and then next slide again, uh, if we look at again the continuous delivery lifecycle, we're now uh, uh, further to the right of CI and testing and committing. And this is really the code review and deploying to a staging environment. Um, now, if we go to the next slide, continuous delivery is very much about delivering minimum viable change. And, and, and why do we do this? Um, well, the idea is. Sometimes we can't fully forecast uh, the uh, effectiveness of a feature or the desire for a feature. We might have customers coming to us, uh, I, you know, uh, asking for this or, or this to address a, a business challenge. Um, but as we all know, sometimes customers are, are, are not always right. Sometimes our uh, most innovative minds are not always right. So how can we mitigate uh, uh, basically um, premature optimization, um, jumping way too far ahead to the right and building a car when maybe the car is not exactly the answer. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, 
uh, Google Glasses is a great, a great example. However, uh, and um, for, for those of you in the tech news know that is Robert Scoble, the Scobleizer. Um, how can we uh, basically incubate uh, these innovations and um, get feedback earlier? Um, so this is where continuous delivery uh, provides an opportunity to, uh, let's say, deploy something to staging where we can begin to share both internally and externally uh, a feature uh, and begin to iterate immediately based on real world feedback. Um, so again, uh, small iterations allow us to uh, validate uh, and also uh, frequent uh, delivery allows us to shorten the feedback cycle. And next slide. Um, th this I borrowed from Jess Humble's um, CICD uh, uh, presentation. Uh, and, and I found this uh, very sobering um, that basically when you sit down to uh, tackle a new feature, uh, one can flip a coin to <laughs> det potentially determine uh, whether this will be uh, all in vain or not. Um, so that something to think about as uh, you sit down and you uh, work on new features. Uh, you know, will this actually be useful? and use continuous de uh, delivery as a way to uh, continuously check those assumptions. So to continue to define what we're talking about here, um, let's move on to the next slide, which is continuous deployment. And if we go to the following slide, uh, we again are back to our software delivery uh, timeline. And this is now where we begin to check the efficacy of a particular uh, deployment uh, and approximate production as close as possible. And the reasoning for this, and if we go to the next slide, uh, is to make sure our software is always production ready. Um, we can easily break production uh, with a configuration change. Oftentimes, with a coding change, uh, uh, breaking production is sometimes weeks. Uh, you know, if let's say a database update ha happens only on a weekly cadence, we won't know for up to a week. But with a configuration change, I can break production immediately on deploy. So uh, this is a way to smokescreen and uh, discover those problems earlier is frequent deployments uh, to a system that as closely aligns to production as possible. And the next slide. And really this is to avoid a release gone wrong. Uh, smaller batches of change reduce risk of releases gone wrong. Uh, and this also allows you to roll the system back. Uh, at the end of the day, when you check in your code, if you break the production deployment in your uh, deployment pipeline, uh, close the laptop, revert your changes, come back tomorrow, do it again. Uh, if you're doing this continuously and daily, uh, this uh, averts any kind of weekends or evenings um, and is really the point of continuous deployment. So the next slide. So what are some of the challenges or barriers to adoption? Um, I would say they fall into potentially two camps. Um, one is cultural uh, and the other is technical or technology related. Uh, I, I would say culture, culture is really the hardest thing to um, address. Uh, as organizations, uh, we are on various uh, uh, scales of adopting some of these practices based on um, our institutional structures. Uh, you know, for a 10 person startup or 20 person startup, it's easier to uh, change culture than a larger enterprise organization. Um, so this is really the hardest one to address. And we're all at various levels uh, at any given point. Um, and when it comes to something like CI, 
uh, one um, one way that uh, uh, CI is uh, uh, quantified in terms of like, are you actually doing it? Uh, are are these three series of questions? Is is everyone contributing to the mainline uh, repository at least once a day? Uh, are you confident in your battery of tests uh, uh, to ensure functionality? And when production is down, uh, is there any person that whose job is more important than to fix production? If you're not addressing all th three of those, then you're probably not doing CI. And again, this is not a... Um, uh, this is in no way a um, ding on your organization. This is just a, a series of questions that one needs to ask themselves when uh, prescribing to the, the CI uh, definition. Um, and then when we talk about the challenges to adopting continuous delivery, um, it's really about what is the context and uh, to what degree it, or extent is CD implemented. Um, and that, that can vary. Uh, and one question that uh, one can ask themselves in terms of the continuous uh, deployment delivery uh, 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 definition in one's organization is, how long does it take your organization to deploy a single line of code in production? Um, so again, these are all questions that one can ask themselves to, uh, as a barometer of uh, how CI or CD uh, is characterized or implemented in your organization. And, you know, this, you know, coming from my background, I've seen a number of scenarios play out uh, when it comes to CI, CD. Uh, C, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, adventure CEO that loves to demo half-baked features on uh, a dev machine. Now that makes the dev uh, that takes hostage of the dev machine. We don't now. We don't as a software development team. We don't have access to that. We weren't quick enough to give uh, to give them a demo URL or a demo box, uh, and now our workflow is on hold. Uh, the uh, DevOps team uh, is slow to respond or uh, wants a, a formalized handoff from development. Uh, so there's a number of blockers or scenarios that uh, are barriers that, that cut across culture and technology. But let's drill into some of the specifics uh, around um, culture and technology. So next slide. Um, so some of these barriers might be, um, uh, do you have a culture of testing and how, uh, uh, how vibrant is that culture of testing? So you potentially have only partial test coverage. Uh, also, what is uh, your branching strategy? Are you uh, working on long-lived branches or not committing to the uh, main line? Uh, th this is... Uh, uh, very particular to uh, Git in some instances, uh, if we prescribe to the uh, Git flow paradigm where um, master's protected, uh, you know, everyone's uh, working on feature branches that eventually get pulled into development, a release branch is created and then merged back in production. So, um, you know, uh, codifying a branching strategy that is, uh, that is more frequent and daily uh, it is, uh, one way to address that, but having a codified branching strategy is um, key uh, to achieving um, a continuous integration uh, paradigm. And also, what is the division of labor? Uh, do we have a rigid dev versus ops organizational structure? And how do we also, um, how do we mitigate the weekend warriors? Uh, those tasked with uh, deployments uh, and uh, freeing up their evenings and weekends. So that's another cultural barrier. And uh, the next slide, technical barriers. Um, disparate tooling. Uh, maybe we have a lot of different uh, tools in the tool chain 
and these come with their uh, licensing costs. Uh, these come with their maintenance costs. Uh, potentially, we have a number of different uh, legacy version control systems that we are running in parallel that also require maintenance and integration. Um, and then the fuzzy distribution of concerns uh, in deployment environments. Uh, is staging truly staging? Uh, or does dev sometimes uh, take on the, the staging responsibility? Um, so uh, being able to really define and uh, create clear buckets of functionality that, uh, that encapsulate their own concerns. So what are some of the solutions, uh, and uh, I'm gonna move on to the next slide here, uh, to uh, address some of these uh, challenges. So here at GitLab, and if we look at the slide uh, that uh, shows the uh, software delivery cycle again, but now we have um, a lot of tools you've probably worked with or currently work with. Uh, this is crazy. I, I've, I've done this. I've been here many, many, many times. Um, I've wired many of these tools together, make sure they can talk to each other when a uh, issue is opened over here, uh, when I commit, it's uh, you know closed. This requires a lot of work to uh, keep all of these applications happy and talking to each other and working. Um, this is really actually, in some cases, the norm. And uh, this is tough. Uh, this is tough to maintain organizationally. And if we move to the next slide, GitLab is really trying to bring all of these tools in that software delivery workflow under one roof. And you might be saying to yourself, oh, who can do all of these things you know, in any given step? Great. Uh, uh, oh, this looks like vendor lock-in. Or um, yeah, I, trust me, <laughs> There's, if you're a gearhead like myself, there are so many other tools that you still need to monitor even after all of this is taken care of. So, um, you know, give yourself a break and try at least with the uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery um, workflow to do something that ties it all together and avoids all of these disparate tools needing to be maintained and paid for. And if we were to, dive right into how uh, GitLab uh, addresses CI CD um, from a feature standpoint. It all really begins with our uh, GitLab CI YAML file. This is really the heart or the brains of the uh, CI CD um, workflow. You define uh, stages of your, uh, your build, and then jobs within those stages. Uh, jobs can uh, be uh, your testing suite. Uh, jobs can uh, do a number of different validations. Um, and the way these stack up, let's move to the next slide, uh, is with the GitLab runner, which uh, executes those jobs. The GitLab runner runs on a separate ser server, ideally. Uh, and is responsible for uh, the workload that the, uh, the jobs define. We move to the next slide. Uh, at, GitLab, at GitLab, we offer um, pipelines as a way to uh, visualize and track the progress of uh, your, your builds. This will be what the runner hooks into. And if we move to the next slide, another feature that we offer as a way to, uh, let's say, address something like continuous delivery uh, is review apps. Uh, if configured against any given branch, a review app will provide you a quick way to validate um, the feature that you're currently developing. So this would uh, basically give you a URL in the application uh, and uh, once committed to, uh, one can share this URL with uh, your colleagues, with a customer, 
to uh, basically navigate to your app and check out whatever feature or piece of business logic that you're uh, try to, trying to iterate upon. And if we move along, uh, we also offer something called Canary deployments. And again, this is uh, similar to review apps in the sense that we're trying to shorten the feedback loop uh, where review apps allow you to quickly share an iteration. Canary deployments, uh, and this is uh, the, the caveat here is um, uh, your organization needs to be working with uh, the Kubernetes technology or container orchestration. Um, this allows you to basically uh, deploy a um, production version of your changes uh, partially to your entire customer base. So if you have 10 servers, you could designate five as uh, canary deployments. So the, uh, the load balancer would potentially send uh, Part, part of your customer base to those five with the new changes. And then one can run A-B tests, one can run a number of different ways to evaluate uh, those new changes in the wild. So again, these are just quick vignettes of what GitLab offers in the way of uh, CI-CD um, and frequent changes and iterations. And if we move to the next slide, cycle analytics. Uh, cycle analytics ties it all together. And really this is a way to uh, measure how your organization is progressing through the software delivery life cycle. Um, and if set up correctly, uh, the idea or the issue that's created around a feature or a subset of features uh, will basically kick off a stopwatch so that when the first commit is uh, uh, submitted for that feature, uh, we can see the time elapsed from the idea and the issue being open to the first commit. Uh, when a branch is merged, we can see the time elapsed uh, between uh, that first commit and the branch being merged. And from staging to deployment to monitoring, we can see all, at all those stages or steps, we can see the time that's elapsed. So this is a way to benchmark how you're doing in that workflow at any given interval. So that's a quick uh, series.